coming up next, Scott Galloway. I can't believe I'm saying that name. Uh, professor of marketing at NYU Stern School of Business. I'm not sure that's how people know him here. Uh, if you've never heard Scott Galloway talk, you uh, should buckle your seatbelts because this gentleman might have an opinion or two about where we should head next. We're going to ask him not just about what he talks about, which is his new book called Adrift, where he talks about all the different things going on in the economy, in the work world. And we've talked a lot here, OG, about the pay gap, women making sure they advocate for themselves. We have Bola Sucumbi on talking about that. He talks about a lot of the problems young men face. And there's some serious problems that young men face right now. So I'm sure he'll bring that to the table as well. Uh, he is... In 2012, named one of the world's best business professors by Poets and Quants. I couldn't imagine being in his class. Um, he's slightly intense, and I'm so glad that we, that we have him here. And Professor Scott Galloway joins us. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm a bit jet lagged. I just got into London this morning, and I'm trying to you know, get through the day so I can fall asleep tonight. That is well. If anything, hopefully, we'll keep you awake. I hope it's the next twenty go. minutes. Let's do let's do our best. By the way, before we start in on this project, Scott, I have to tell you that uh, you don't know this. You and I share the same love, and I say love with air quotes for a certain brokerage account that I've seen you go off on a brokerage company that uh, maybe misnamed steals from the poor to give to the rich, aka themselves. Yeah. Uh, so Say more. Uh, Robin Hood, specifically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, no. I, I guess the company, you're, you're not a fan. I, I am not a fan. In fact, it's funny. We've had people, we've had fans of our show that have said, uh, why do you come down on Robin Hood so much? I'm like, this, company's, this company does something that should be very basic. And I feel like the fact that they continually uh, have oops moments drives me crazy. Yeah, it's... it's um uh, I think it's really unfortunate. It kind of ties into one of my big themes in the book is failing young men. And I think, so first off, men, 85% of gambling addicts are male. And uh, also gambling addiction has the highest suicide rate because you can get in really deep and nobody knows. And then you feel as if there's no way out. If you have a meth problem, people figure it out and usually intervene. And gambling, you can lose your house, your kid's college fund, spend all of your, you know, bust all you know bust all your life insurance and nobody knows uh so it's really it's really a um it's a very mendacious um uh addiction and i feel that robin hood uh, was in the business of figuring out a way to create a business model that incentivized them to addict young people to gambling there's nothing when you're trading options in crypto which is about 60 70 percent of their revenue that's not investing. That's gambling. And there are kind of dark psychological techniques around random rewards and visual stimulation. We're just there simply to addict young men in a period where I think a lot of young men were bored, had some money from stimulus checks, and it's also a really shitty business. They've actually lost accounts. Their average size dollar value, dollar value of their accounts is $260. Uh, the stock's off 90%, which means it went down 80% and then got cut in half again. And I think it could go down another 90%. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't like the company. I think the founders represent kind of what's horrible about Silicon Valley, a group of young men who conflate luck with talent and don't really feel any sort of fidelity or loyalty to the Commonwealth or, you know, other Americans. So you and I are brothers from another mother on those issues. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, when, when I heard you rail against that, I think that was first, Scott, when I fell in love with you. I think that was it. But like, well, that. It? <laughs> that was the moment. <laughs> there was a magic moment. They were playing our song. Uh, the genesis of this project in, in particular, in, in these 100 charts, tell me about just the making of. How did you uh, get this idea? So we've had an alphabet for 1,500 years. We've had the computer for 50 years. But we've had images. Uh, we've been trying to interpret or communicate uh, images or with uh, interpret, interpret and communicate with images for thousands, tens of thousands of years, whether it's paintings on the side of a cave wall or making plans based on the height of the sun in the sky. 
So as a result, we can absorb or process or understand images six to 60 times faster than words. And I've always just been fascinated with charts and a basic kind of dictum across our company has always been, can we say this with a graph or a chart? And uh, I thought when you're sort of trying to tell the story of, of America in terms of what ails us economically, what are some of the opportunities, what are some of the solutions, I thought it easiest to do it through charts. Now, every, the way the book's set up, it has a chart on the left-hand side, on the, right, on the left window, and then on the right pane, it has a narrative. But it's meant to build a story, starting with how did we get here, recognizing the unbelievable achievements of America, uh, talking about the middle class as a ballast for any society and what's happened to our middle class, talking about our innovators, talking about failing young men, talking about higher ed, uh, and then talking about uh, some proposed solutions. Uh, but yeah, try to do it with charts. I want to ask you questions on just a few of these topics. You begin the book talking about shareholder value and this rise in the 60s and 70s in shareholder value. Where did this narrative begin and and how did it catch on so much where it's really, to your point, all most boards think about these days? Yeah, I don't know if it was Milton Freeman or the era of Jack Welch uh, or the fact that shareholder returns were really poor during the 60s and 70s, but basically capital sort of uh, bound together and said, we deserve more. And management isn't taking capital or investors seriously, and they got more organized. And also this notion from Milton Friedman that shareholder value is, you know, I think something along with any CEO focuses on anything other than shareholder value is doing a disservice to the country. It was something like that. And it was a very easy romantic vision to kind of follow. And it was also the people who were mostly responsible for deciding whether that would be their North Star became tremendously incented to do everything optimized for shareholder value. Uh, Boards of directors who usually represent shareholders, not the workers. In Germany, half the board uh, is represented by usually the biggest union that works at the company. In the U.S., essentially, directors represent shareholders for the most part. They talk about, they now use the word stakeholders, not shareholders, but for the last 50 years it's been all about the share price. And then typically management who decides what they're going to pay people, where they're going to invest. The majority of their compensation comes from shares or the, the, the share price. So everything began getting optimized for uh, the, the price of the shares in about the early 70s. And there was this great uncoupling, if you will. And that is up until that point, Wages and productivity in America were sort of inextricably linked. They look like two snakes dancing with each other, intertwined. You know, if productivity went up 3%, wages went up 27 Everyone sort of shared in the prosperity. And then in 1970, wages went flat for 50 years, and productivity kept skyrocketing. And the delta between those two is literally trillions of dollars, if not tens of trillions of dollars in excess value that was captured all by shareholders because... When you're totally optimized for shareholder value, you're much more inclined to buy shares back rather than invest in plant property and equipment or new employees. You're much more likely uh, to fight any sort of minimum wage. You're much more likely to fight any union. You're much more likely to pay people less or have software that clocks them out automatically when your North Star is just shareholder value. It used to be a lot of things 100 years ago, not just that. And so that was kind of the, and there's even a website on it uh, that just, talks about nothing but what happened in the early 70s when all of a sudden we decided to make shareholders king, or actually you'd say the consumer's king, shareholders of the prince, and workers of the pauper. uh, I want to to dive into that a little bit more because you have two charts in that first chapter, which uh, I think make this point very well. Uh, During the time frame you have in the chart, worker productivity up 120%, wages are stagnant, what you talked about. At the end of your book, you bring up some really big ideas about what we need to do, Scott, as society. But if I'm somebody who's just worried about what Stephen Covey said, you know, my realm Mm -hmm. of direct control, if Mm -hmm. I'm a young person and I know that there's this huge income inequality gap between the top 1% and the bottom 99%, things are getting better. Like, what do I do with this? How do I take this and then begin to form a career that makes sense? Well, so there's kind of your larger concerns around the Commonwealth, and I would say at the end of the day, it's vote. Uh, Half the people in America are under the age of 38, but only 5% of our elected officials are under the age of 38. The place we hold the first, the two states we hold 
the first presidential primaries, which kind of largely dictates who's going to be president, are all two of the oldest states in the union. They're Iowa and Maine. So as a result, our elected representatives and our president uh, do a great job of representing older people, not younger people. So we've affected a transfer of wealth from young to old that's just unprecedented. The percentage of GDP that people under the age of 40 uh, register their wealth used to be 19% of GDP. Now it's 9 Meanwhile, the wow. average person over the age of 75 has seen their wealth increase 72%. It's down, I think, 24% for people under the age of 40. So look at the two largest tax deductions, mortgage interest rate and capital gains, who owns home and owns stocks, old people who rents and makes all of their money from sweat and current income, young people. So these aren't people like to, there's this, what I call this illusion of complexity or the world is what it is ism, and that is People throw up their arms and say, you know, th these forces are bigger than us. No, no, these are, these are deliberate decisions we made to transfer money from young people to old people and to transfer money from workers to shareholders. These are deliberate decisions. That's the bad news. The good news is we can absolutely unwind them. So you asked me what should a young person do. I think a lot about, one, I think young people should be focused on developing their own economic security. I think they should be very focused on it. I think in a Capitalist society, uh, America becomes more like itself every day, and that is it's a loving, generous place for people who have economic security. It's a rapacious, unkind place for people who don't have economic security. So I think you should be focused on, one, getting to a city. I think that being in a city is like playing tennis constantly against someone who's better than you. Your, your game elevates. You're around the best and brightest, and you'll have the most contacts and opportunities for selecting a mate, selecting a job, selecting interesting things to do, people to do it with. Uh, to get certified. I don't know if it's a you know scuba certification or class three driver's license or uh, certification in you know repairing a certain type of electron electric motor or a college degree. We live in a LinkedIn economy. You need to be certified. Uh, try and live like a stoic when you're young. Try and save some money. I mean, it's just such it's so passe, but it's so true. If you can save a thousand bucks a month from the age of 22 to 40. You're kind of done. You're, you're going to end up at 60 with economic security, uh, as opposed to what I did. I really didn't start saving money till 35 because I thought it was such a baller that at some point it would rain money. <laughs> that was me. And Sorry, that was me too. That was totally I me. I think that's most of us. So it's kind of do as I say, not as I do. I realize it takes discipline, but um, you know, I've made a lot of money over the last 15 years. I got very lucky with some of the business I sold. I have a friend who's never really made a lot of money, but he's always like from day one been talking about 401ks and putting money away and he's he's got as much money as i do and it's because he's just been smarter about it more disciplined i had a few more fun weekends in ensenada and at mammoth mountain you know weekend trips with my ucla buddies but he was just smarter more disciplined about it you know find uh force yourself to try and be around strangers every day and i think this is especially important in an era of covid where we're more distanced from each other we're more uh, remote and isolated from each other try and put yourself put some structure around yourself such that every day you're around strangers in the agency of something else the agency of work the agency of government service nonprofit service the agency of god whatever it might be the agency of sports but just try and be around strangers every day because the most important decision you'll make is who you partner with the rest of your life specifically who you have kids with and the quality and fit of that decision will be a function of how many people you bump off of and I worry, especially with young men, 32% uh, of them are single under the age of 30. It's 51% for women. So 50% more women than men have some sort of a romantic partner. And I think young men uh, need it more. I think they need guardrails. I think they need motivation. I think they need to learn how to read a room. I think they need structure more. Uh, so anyway, a long-winded way of saying get certified, get to a city, yeah. try and put yourself in a position, whether it's an office or something else such that every day you're meeting new and different people, try and live below your means. Uh, and I always say your, your goal isn't to find your passion, it's to find your talent. And then once you identify something you're really good at naturally, to invest the thousands of hours of becoming great at it. And once you're great at it, you'll be able to command uh, currency in the marketplace that result in margin. It'll just make your life a lot easier. But I'm, I'm pretty, pretty, you know, kind of tasks one and two are put yourself on a path to economic security, and two, try and put yourself in a position where you have a lot of opportunities to meet potential mates. I think the elemental foundation of any society is relationships. And the friends I have that are happiest aren't the ones that are most successful, 
that is important, but uh, the ones who have the best partnerships. Uh, so I, I think those two things are kind of kind of the focus. Talking about getting certified, um, I saw you recently on TikTok. By the way, great to have somebody, uh, Scott, that's not dancing on TikTok. Congratulations on avoiding yeah. that. The, the, yeah, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> but, but yeah, nobody I, needs to see me dance. That's that's not me, a good look. <laughs> me neither. But but you do say, and this is using Joe words, not uh, not Professor Galloway words. Uh, we need to take some of the stank off the trades in the United States, and I found those certifications to be interesting. Tell me about that path and why we need that path more. And is that an easier path or is is that a different path that just is closed because it's not, quote, cool? Yeah, so 50% of Germans have some sort of vocational certification. It's less than 10% in America. And we have sort of fetishized the traditional liberal arts, Bachelor of Arts degree from a college. And parents have been told, to a certain extent, you've failed if your kid doesn't end up at Brown and then at MIT or KKR. Like you just don't hear parents bragging, yeah, our kid didn't go to college, but he's making 120 grand a year as a plumber. That's just not cocktail banter. And we've become very much a lottery ticket, winner-take-all society where your job isn't to be a solid citizen in the middle class. It's to swing as hard as you can to try and be a billionaire or get beamed in the face trying. And we fetishize elite colleges. We Two-thirds of kids do not end up with a traditional college degree. And the Main Street economy has more jobs than we can fill. Uh, if you can show up to a construction site in Florida right now, and if you're just handy, you can make 20 to 25 bucks an hour. If you have any sort of skills or training, you can probably make 30 to 40 bucks an hour. And uh, I believe our higher education universities need to have their uh, tax exempt status revoked if they don't grow their freshman classes faster. Uh, than population growth. And I also think the opportunity for that $600 billion to $1 trillion we spent on student debt relief would have been to enter into a grand bargain with our public universities, which educate two of the three kids in our nation, and said, look, we want you to, uh, we're going to pay for it, but we want you to, one, expand your freshman classes, two, lower costs, and three, come up with a series of non traditional vocational certifications, a two year certificate in cybersecurity that focuses on math and technology. There's a line out the door of employers that would hire those people at six figures, especially construction. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna be building nuclear power plants all over the nation again, installing solar panels, installing uh, energy efficient HVAC, figuring out a way to fix all of these electric motors that are gonna start breaking down in the next few years. Who's going to fix all of these, really, all this really sophisticated equipment that is now in every, every hospital? So uh, I think we need more mainline, I think we need more vocational certification that foots to the mainline economy that creates great middle class jobs and recognizes that a lot of kids just don't want to go to college. They're up for apprenticeships, they're up for training. But we need to stop, um, I don't know the term is we kind of slander it or we. Uh, yeah. Demonize is the wrong word, but young people say they'd rather be a barista than a welder. A welder makes 90K a year, and it's a good job. And I, I also, I have dogs. The example I use is, so I've gotten to know my carpet cleaner guy really well. You know, dogs and carpets <laughs> do not mix. And this guy there's is the a, carpet. There's a, there's a graph right there, Scott. Dogs, yeah. carpets, yeah. Well, especially when you have a Great Dane. I mean, it's just, and, a, and, and she's a puppy. And I, I won't get into details, but she is, it's not a good idea to have carpets. Um, anyways, uh, so I know this guy is our carpet cleaner and started the business. He got, I think, about a month of training from a, an apprentice at the age of like 50. He was a pilot and he got laid off as, uh, you know, the eighth time that Spirit Airlines or whoever it was, EasyJet, reorganized. Bought a van, got some training, bought a bunch of solutions, and he can get any substance out of any carpet. The guy's a carpet whisperer. And it sounds like a shitty job, but he's out He's out and about, he's meeting nice people, he's doing interesting things, he's like making people happy. Oh my God, he saved the couch. And I kind of did the math. I think he's pulling down about 250 to 300 gross, and I bet he clears about 180 after he pays for the van, he buys a few Google keywords. And he can't, he said, I'm turning away business. So he's thinking about actually, he's bringing his niece into the business, and she's this young, young woman who was in the army two years, didn't have a lot of prospects, and she's now, she's this, you know, young, cool woman, like tiny thing, five foot one, all tatted up. And she's learning how to clean carpets. And I think we need to institutionalize that. I think that we need to 
stop fetishizing the traditional route that we've decided is the way for all young people and celebrate work. One of the things that's wonderful about America is we work. We work really hard. And I think there's a lot of dignity in it. I don't know about you. I get my identity from work. I'm not proud of that, sure. but it's the truth. And the the opportunity to work hard and create economic security, the dignity, I think it's a big part. A big part of mental health is feeling like you have purpose 40, 50, 60 hours a week, especially if you're not the primary caregiver for kids, which can take up a lot of time. But if you aren't charged with that, you know, working and making money just solves a lot of problems. And I know that sounds crass, but that is, you know, work. I, I find that if you can give someone a good job that they like and they get good at it and they start making more money and they start getting prestige and they can show up and say, I can get a stain out of anything. There's some level of, uh, there's, there's a level of confidence and self-esteem there. Pride. And yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And then, you know, who knows, maybe you're really ambitious and you buy a second van and you hire somebody else. The, the, the guy next door is a small business person and owns a car wash and makes millions of dollars. Anyways, I'm, I think we need to institutionalize vocational programs. I think that's a huge opportunity uh, for America. And I think our higher education um, uh, infrastructure needs to get more involved in it because right now we'd rather loan someone $200,000 to get a degree in history from an elite university that they may or may not be able to pay back. Uh, so I, I think uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity around vocational certification. I want to I want to transition for my last question from that into just a whole different area, which is. Um, uh, uh, where where America's headed because m most of your chapters talk about how we're losing the sense of community, the fact that rotary clubs are going away, the fact that uh, we w people are not making more money while the founders are making more money and yet we're idolizing the people that are founding companies. In fact, one of your more bizarre uh, <laughs> one of your more bizarre pictures in the book shows the number of people, the number of times the founders mentioned today versus was mentioned twenty. 20 and 30 years ago in in corporate filings and all of a sudden now everybody's bragging about who founded the company at the same time you also talk about the number of americans that own a cell phone 97 percent versus 92 percent of all drinking water that meets epa standards just some truly some truly big stats scott that show that our head maybe isn't where it should be and there might not be the opportunity for everybody that we think that there is. And I'm wondering, with all of with all of you know s social media today, which supposedly helps us get more together, we feel more isolated. You talk about men feeling more isolated. I'm wondering if we've magnified this Horatio Alger American dream thing to the point that we were. A okay with cashing in, like the American dream has kind of gotten away from us to the point that we're we think, hey, I just want to be this guy. I don't really care about employees. I don't care about my local community. I just want to be that one rich person. Would you say that that's kind of where you're headed here, or or where we're headed? Yeah, a lot there. So uh, yes. uh, sorry about uh, that. Very very big picture, broad brush. As a as a society becomes more educated and wealthy church attendance and reliance on a super band goes down. But our questions get bigger and bigger. So in that void has slipstreamed tech innovators. Every third year times person of the year is the richest guy in tech. It's not the most famous doctor. It's not the most famous engineer. It's not the most famous astronaut. It's the wealthiest tech guy. I don't care if it's Bill, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Every third year times person of the year, or we decide in America the person who's the person of the year is whoever's the wealthiest tech person. And it's understandable because we've developed this idolatry of innovators. And the closest thing to God that we have is technology. It's mystical. I have no idea how my iPhone works. I just know it's amazing. And these people are not only geniuses at making this shit happen. They make billions of dollars. And we have this idolatry of the dollar. So we put these people up on a pedestal. I think, I think Steve Jobs is our generation's Jesus Christ. And I think Elon Musk has kind of taken that mantle. And it's unhealthy because they get to live by a different set of standards. Um, they, they will shitpost our government. They are profane. Uh, and also, I find that the lack of patriotism that they demonstrate infects younger men. And I think it's totally unwarranted and obnoxious. Uh, I 
think there's a reason that Elon Musk did not start an EV company in South Africa or that he's not launching rockets from a pad in Montreal. If you look at the Pacific coastline, it's littered up and down California with companies that have created the value of the GDP of a small Central American nation, whether it's Qualcomm in San Diego up to uh, El Segundo with SpaceX, Los Angeles or Venice with Snap. You keep going north, you get to you get to obviously to to Meta, to Google, to Salesforce, and you can keep going north, you get to Amazon and Microsoft. And then something happens around the, just above Seattle. It kind of stops. There's Lululemon up in Vancouver, but that's about it. And then when you get to Qualcomm down in La Jolla, again, it stops. And you got to go thousands of miles until you get to Mercado Libre in Buenos Aires. So it's clear there's something about America, and specifically the most valuable companies in the world all have one thing in common. They're a layer of genius innovation built on top of investments made by middle-class Americans, whether it was DARPA or GPS or the U.S. Post system. And so for these guys to be less fond or less appreciative of America, I find obnoxious. The people who are most patriotic are the ones who have invested most in America, are veterans. And the people who are least patriotic, in my mind, are the ones who have benefited most from America, and that's our tech innovators. So I find it really discouraging that the people that young men model uh, want to say things like, Elon Musk has said, uh, you know, the government just needs to get out of the way. He says that all the time. Should government have gotten out of the way when they lent you $450 million when your company was very, very early? Should we get out of the way in terms of the EV subsidies we're providing? Should we get out of the way in terms of the the charging stations that all taxpayers are paying for right now to make electric vehicles viable? So the, there's a virus that infects, I consider myself part of the tech community, there's a virus that infects us, and that is we conflate luck with talent. And the smartest thing I ever did was to be born a white heterosexual male in California in 1964. That's the reason I'm here talking to you. I'm remarkably talented. I am not a modest person. I'm in the top 1%. And in, on this, in this world, that'll put me in a room the size of Germany. And I live a much nicer life than the top 80 million people on this planet. And it's because I was born at the right place in the right time. And I'd like to think that I appreciate that and that I have reverence for our, our if find me someone who's incredibly smart and wildly underpaid and they usually work for one organization, the US government. Find me someone who's wildly overpaid and totally unappreciative and there's your tech executive. So I think they're terrible role models for young men. I think we've lost a lot of connective tissue. We don't respect our institutions. America has never been stronger. Our government has never been, in my view, um, um, more important. And it disappoints me that we don't have any connective tissue and we become weird. A third of, a third of uh, each party feels that the other party is their enemy. 54% of Democrats are worried about their son or daughter marrying a Republican. And what we need to realize is that Americans' best allies will always be other Americans. And I think our idols are telling us uh, otherwise. And then they build companies that pit us against each other, exploit us, addict us. So I think the tech community sort of lost the script, and I think that they believe they're not. I don't believe they're held to the same set of standards as anybody else. I think if 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 they found out that this podcast could be directly linked to an increase in teen depression and suicide, you and I would be out of a job. And that doesn't seem to be the case in big tech. That was a rant. That was well, a rant. <laughs> well, well, and I puked out a question and you puked out an yeah, answer. Yeah. Your answer was yeah. better than my question, though, brother. Uh, the book is Adrift, America in 100 Charts, and you have some big solutions at the end of the book. I was glued from the beginning to the end. Thanks so much for spending some time with our Stacker community, helping us, uh, helping us grapple with some of the big questions. Scott, I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Congratulations on your success.